It's hard to believe that 10 or 11,000 years ago, here, where the bog now is, there was a great lake that extended as far as the eye could see in every direction. But the evidence is down there beneath five or six, sometimes seven meters of peat, in the form of the clay that accumulated in that lake. And where turf cutting has cut a vertical section through those many meters of peat, we can trace the subsequent development of the bog over the several millennia of its growth. There is the white clay at the base, and above that half a metre or so of black fen peat. Then the brown peat of the bog takes over. The varying colour of the peat up through the profile is due to the changing nature of the vegetation as the bog grew over time. These lighter layers are dominated by sphagnum moss, while the darker layers have lots of heather twigs. The upper few metres is largely sphagnum moss, reflecting much wetter conditions. So this is the brown turf, and if you split it open parallel to its layers, you can see it contains lots of twigs of heather. Sometimes you can see flattened stems of bog cotton, uh, plants like that. And this is, the, this is the sphagnum peat, which, which dominates the upper part of the peat profile, sometimes to a depth of several metres. And that's made almost complete, made up almost completely of sphagnum leaves and stems. And under a microscope, you can actually identify the particular species of sphagnum to species level. So it gives us a pretty detailed rec record, a pretty detailed picture of, uh, of, uh, of how the bog was growing and developing in response to changing conditions at the surface and in its surroundings. But with the powerful microscope, we can see much more than stems and leaves. We can actually identify the pollen grains that rain down on the bog during all the centuries of its growth. And this gives us a remarkably detailed picture of how the bog surface itself was changing, but more importantly, of how the woodland and forest in the surroundings was changing over time. This pollen record Preserved for us in the upward growing peat of the bogs provides us with a picture of how the landscape around the bog was changing over the last several millennia. Every species or group of species has its own distinctive pollen grain and these grains have a very tough outer skin or integument so that the annual rain of pollen falling on lakes or bogs is preserved in the peat of the bog or the bottom sediment of the lake. The pollen comes mainly from wind-pollinated trees which produce enormous quantities, so the record in the peat gives us a measure of how the woodland changed over the millennia that followed the retreat of the ice. This series of microscope images shows the pollen grains of elm, hazel, birch, oak, pine and alder, as well as ribwort plantain and bog bean at the bottom. This is the upper part of a pollen diagram from All Saints Bog in Offaly, showing the last thousand years or so, beginning at the bottom. The width of the coloured vertical bands representing the different species, mainly of trees, is proportional to the abundance of their pollen at different periods over time. The most striking thing about this particular diagram is a dramatic reduction in the area of woodland, dominated mainly by hazel, beginning late in the 17th century, and the resulting expansion in the area of open land dominated by the grasses of farmland. To begin with, the bogs were confined to depressions and low places in the landscape. But once conditions became suitable for sphagnum to become dominant at the surface, the bog could grow upwards independently of the level of the water table in the surrounding landscape because sphagnum has the most extraordinary water holding capacity and it has the chemical ability to maintain conditions in an acidic state in its surroundings which inhibits the growth of competing vegetation which might otherwise smother the sphagnum.
This enabled the bog to grow upwards indefinitely, so that in time it assumed a domed profile and began to encroach ever further sideways on surrounding land that was covered in forest, swamping and eventually entombing the trees. And where the bog has been stripped away, we can often see the entombed remains of these ancient forests, the trees often bulldozed away, but sometimes still rooted in their original places. They are generally of Scots pine, although oak, yew and other species are not uncommon. These remains are usually the rooted stumps of Scotch pine trees. And where the stems have subsequently been cut across, it's often possible to count the annual growth rings of the tree. And it's also sometimes possible to measure the distances between the individual trees when they're still in their original position. And this enables us to reconstruct in outline the great forest that grew here before it was subsequently entombed by the encroaching bog. Nearly 430 rooted trees of the ancient pine forest, as well as close to 40 fallen trunks, have been studied and measured here at Clongowney and at nearby Dryna in South Offaly. Here at Clongowney, 13% of the trees had a diameter of 90 centimetres or over, that is, they were over 200 years old, and 35% had a diameter of 46 centimetres, or over 100 years old. This means that this forest was similar in many respects to the native pine wood stands of present-day Scotland, with a varied age structure and a multi-layered tree canopy. It gives us a glimpse not only of what this area was like all those thousands of years ago, but what cutaway areas such as this could become again in the future if we take the right decisions now. The oldest tree recorded in the forest at Dryna next door was 311 years old. Only the stumps of the trees are still rooted where they grew. The rotting stems have snapped away and can sometimes be found lying beside the anchored stumps. Because it is such a challenging place to live, permanently waterlogged, acidic, generally open and windswept, and seriously nutrient deficient, the bog is a very interesting place in ecological terms. And the plants that grow here need to have special strategies in order to survive. And one of the most interesting of these strategies, which is found in several groups of bog plants, uh, is to become carnivorous. In other words, to rely for their nutrient supply not on the nutrients that they can obtain from the peat soil, which has virtually none, but from the bodies of animals. And of the several groups of insectivorous plants of the bog, uh, the most eye-catching and certainly the most common are the sundews. The leaves of sundews are covered with tentacles, each with a little knob-like gland at the end that secretes an extremely viscid glue which glistens like dew in the sun and turns the leaf into a very efficient fly trap. When an insect alights on the leaf, the tentacles closest to it bend towards the centre, gradually followed by those further away. Small insects are the usual prey, but creatures as large as dragonflies are sometimes captured. The tentacle glands also secrete a range of enzymes that dissolve all but the skeleton of the victim and they are also largely responsible for absorbing the resulting fluid. When the prey has been digested, the leaves open out again and secretion slows down so that the leaves can dry out. This means that hard parts, like the chitinous skeleton, can be blown away before the leaf starts to secrete its deceptive dew again. These are the flowers of bladderwort. 
which lives in pools on the bog and is really hardly recognisable as a flowering plant except when the pale yellow flowers appear at the surface in midsummer. The rest of the plant consists of a series of tiny bladder-like structures arranged along the stems. These bladders are the most fascinating part of the plant. Indeed, they are among the most intricate structures found anywhere in the plant kingdom. At the entrance of each bladder is a little one-way valve or trapdoor with trigger hairs. This valve is structured in such a way that it can only open inwards. When a small creature touches the bristles on the surface of the valve, it opens and the walls of the bladder are triggered so as to suddenly distend by as much as 80% of their volume, sucking water into the bladder along with the hapless creature that triggered the response. All this happens in 10 to 15 thousandths of a second. Once inside, there is no way out and the prey is digested by enzymes and acid secreted by the wall of the bladder. The trap is ready for action again between half an hour and two hours after it has been sprung. Behind the movement of debris at the surface, you can see the busy movement of numerous microinvertebrates, a populous prey for the plant. Other types of nutrient strategies include symbiotic associations between the plant and specialised fungi in the soil, where the fungus provides the plant with phosphate and nitrogen in exchange for the carbohydrates the photosynthetic plants can manufacture in abundance. Fungi cannot manufacture their own food, but they can harvest its nutrient ingredients efficiently. This is the strategy developed by the several members of the heather family that are such an important part of the bog vegetation. Yet other bog species, such as sedges, like bog cotton, survive by carefully hoarding the meagre nutrient supply they manage to extract from the peat. The sphagnum mosses get their minuscule nutrient requirements from rainfall, for which reason these raised bogs are described as ombrotrophic, ombros being the Greek word for a cloud. Because the bog is such an open place, the animals that live here are much more easily spotted by would-be predators. And the most widely adopted stratagem to avoid being spotted is camouflage. And there are some superb examples, particularly among the insects that live on the bog. None more so perhaps than the emperor moth whose caterpillars resemble the colours and patterns of the heather on which they feed. The eggs are laid in early summer. As it grows, the caterpillar turns from black to green with a black band on each segment. The green area is between, with seven pink or yellow tubercles with tufts of short black bristles. The spiracles through which the caterpillar breathes are bright orange in colour. It is fully grown as the heather begins to flower, and this wonderful display of colour, which would make the insect so conspicuous against a uniform background, enables it to disappear against the green and pink and black of the flowering heather. In autumn, the caterpillar spins a silken sarcophagus inside which its body dissolves, in the amazing transformation of metamorphosis. The pupil case inside has a trapdoor at one end that enables the adult moth to emerge. The forewings of the female have prominent eye spots. The hind wings have a similar eye spot standing out against a broad white band. The female is on the wing only in darkness, but the somewhat less conspicuous male frequently flies by day. It has a most remarkable sense of smell and can locate a female in the darkness from several kilometres away. But the emperor moth is only one, if among the most eye-catching and amazing, of the several hundred or more insect species that live here. Each of these species has its own story to tell, 
and each one really needs its own ten minutes to even outline the wonder of its life. Open pools are a characteristic feature of the bog and these have a varied and fascinating fauna of invertebrates including many water beetles and bugs and the bog or raft spider which lies in wait for unwary insect prey on the margins of the pools. These wet places provide ideal habitat for newts and frogs and the common lizard, Ireland's only native reptile, is found in drier parts of the bog. Several bird species are at home on the open bog, including the skylark and meadow pipit, and many others occur in the wooded fringes that surround most bogs. This is where you are most likely to hear in summer the parasitic cuckoo, whose favourite host is the meadow pipit. All of this is, to an extent, a thing of the past. The great raised bogs which once covered vast tracts of land in the Midlands have largely disappeared, mainly as a result of industrial mining of their reserves of peat, especially over the last 75 years or so. And it's only in recent decades that we have come to realise and to properly appreciate the extent of what their disappearance represents in terms of lost biodiversity in ecological terms. In the third part of this series we'll take a look at what we can do, what we urgently need to do to look after what little remains of the intact raised bogs and at what we can do to restore to all the bogs that have been depleted of their peat reserves as much as we can of their biological diversity.